Welcome back to the Films We Make podcast. This week is a jam-packed episode full of so many important topics within the wedding filmmaking world. This week, I sat down with Isaac from Isaac Subtle Films, who has been really inspiring me lately with some of his work on YouTube, and we just had some amazing conversations, very candid conversations about the power of YouTube and how important this platform is for wedding filmmakers. And the most important question, is wedding filmmaking a short-term or long-term venture? Is there a finish line for wedding filmmakers? And if so, when? So I hope you all enjoy this candid conversation between two wedding filmmakers. And if you do, make sure you go over to Isaac's YouTube channel and show him some love. He has a wealth of inspiration over on his channel with how he captures and tells stories. But without further ado, let's jump in to this week's episode of The Films We Make Podcast. Diving into the art of filmmaking for a second, because I remember before I worked with you in July, um, you know, we connected on, on YouTube and, um, everything else. I had like checked out your channel and there's a lot of wedding films on your page that have actually like kind of exploded. Um, and so I really just want to like kind of start at the beginning, like of your filmmaking journey. Like when did you get started? And, um, have you always had a love for filmmaking or, um, did it just, kind of happen over the last few years or just kind of like touch on that story i'd love to hear it yeah so it kind of all started when uh my friends and i when we were like 12 13 just started making stupid action films for youtube uh-huh. um that's how it all started so my my good friend um tony he he works out in la as a dp and kind of a camera op and stuff like that but we we've been best friends and he got me into it at a young age so uh, ever since 12, 13, doing that, I always had a passion for filmmaking and for films, um, so much so that I went to Liberty University to pursue cinematic arts. Um, that was the degree I um, wanted to go down and kind of that path, kind of the Hollywood, you know, mm-hmm. style of filmmaking, crews, narrative filmmaking, stuff like that. Um, but going into my senior year of film school, the uh, the student loan debt and just the finances involved. And just looking at my future, I was like, I don't know if this is worth the cost. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had been a poor steward of like creating friendships in film school and in college in general. And really to get into the industry, you have to have relationships. That's yeah. a huge thing. And those connections. And I realized I didn't have that. I didn't capitalize on that. So I just left school, um, just kind of trusted God to just put opportunity in my path. And then uh, that's where I moved to Louisiana and got job opportunity at a creative, um, on a creative team at a church there. But it was shortly after that where my wife actually told a friend at the time, she was my uh, just my girlfriend, but uh, she told one of her friends, like, hey, Isaac works in video. Ask him to do your wedding. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, I charged her $2,000, which I feel like for my skill set, that was great at the time. Yeah. And I just studied a lot of Matt Johnson's videos. You know, I, I feel like he was kind of the pioneer about four and a half, five years ago. And uh, dude, ever since April 2019, it's just been, you know, that's kind of how I got started on this journey. Diving into one thing that you said about um, going to school for film. Um, I think I kind of have like the answer, but yeah. Do you like looking back, like feel that for anyone who's maybe considering film school, do you think in today's just modern age of education and just the resources that are out there? I mean, do you think film school is really like really worth it for new up and coming aspiring filmmakers? I say, if you go in with the right intentions and you have the money, um, yeah. that's the big thing. I, I, looking back, I never encourage people to go into debt for, um, for a certain degree where you can probably make it if you just put in the hard work and some youtube.edu, mm-hmm. um, and some other, um, 
just like even classrooms, you know, I know a lot of photographers, videographers, filmmakers offer their own classrooms and some are really great. So even that's an avenue, but I would really only recommend it if you're going in with the right intentions to build relationships and if you can afford it. Yeah. I mean, those are really, really good points. I think that that was one thing that, you know, I did as well. And I mean, cause I went to, I want to say it was film school. It was more like media studies was the degree that I pursued. Um, And I graduated high school in 2010 and I didn't get my degree until 2019 just because I was, I was working and then I decided to just take a year off of school. And then my parents kept saying, Oh, well you should finish your degree. You know, you'll, you'll regret not getting that degree. And now I look back and I'm like, I regret this plaque that's hanging up in my, my office right now, because that is a $30,000, uh, mistake that I really don't even use. I feel like I don't use my degree in the sense of how my parents use degrees and other generation use their college education. You know, they used it to acquire jobs within that field and to make, you know, a a decent income. And yeah, for me, I feel like I've, I went from high school to, I was, I was waiting tables. And then after waiting tables, I jumped like right into, I mean, the wedding industry really and just kind of built the business up from there. And yeah, I always felt that university was was kind of, I don't want to say pointless, but it was just my experience that it wasn't um, beneficial in, in my world. I'm not saying that it can't be for some people. Um, I think you're you're absolutely right. If you go in with the mindset of, you know, building relationships and you, you have the money, if you're lucky enough to have maybe... Um, you know, a college fund, uh, parents who, who can help you out or you're on a scholarship, uh, whatever it is. Um, yeah, definitely don't recommend going into debt. I mean, I'm still paying off my student loans. Um, Same. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I don't think it's worth it from my perspective, but uh, yeah, others, others might disagree. Um, but yeah, I, I, I love, I love like your, your journey into wedding filmmaking. And one thing that you said that was like, it kind of stood out too is so your first wedding you actually charged two thousand dollars yeah so i guess i guess i skipped over one little bit i had actually shot weddings before but it wasn't like on a consistent basis so my first ever wedding i shot for like i think 150 dollars in 2015 so but i was like i wasn't taking it seriously i'm like oh sure i'll film it whatever um i look back and i'm like wow i've improved a lot but <laughs> i i feel like that $2000 wedding i really knew what i was doing and i was mm-hmm. confident in my skills just from you know there were some things i learned in film school that really did help but i learned a lot of what i knew about um technique and camera settings and everything from my job um at the church So I went into that wedding knowing a lot about technique, about composition and everything. So I felt confident with $2,000. And uh, that was April 2019, I did that wedding. And then after that wedding, I shot, I believe about eight films that year. And then 2020 slowed down, obviously because of COVID. But 2021 and 2022, I think I shot a combined 40 weddings between those years. So wow. it just kind of took off from 2019 once I established my quality and craft. And I feel like a lot of people and just connections with photographers just built up over time. Um, and it was just kind of off to the races from there. Yeah, that's that's amazing. I love that. And I mean, looking at your films too, I was I was watching, which one was it? I think it was Shelby and Nathan. Um it was like uh, you shot it with the Sony FX3, and mm-hmm. I was I was watching this film. I was like, man, it's just like there's just a quality and a feeling to like your films that is just so. I'm trying to think of the right word. I mean, it's, I mean, attractive comes to mind, but also just like engaging, like visually engaging. Um, which for me as a wedding filmmaker and someone who's seen a lot of wedding films, it's like, I, sometimes it's, I get super distracted watching films, but yeah, for yours, I just felt like, so just entranced. That's a good word. Entranced with oh, the, thanks, the, man. <laughs> the quality. Yeah. And so, I mean, even some of the films on YouTube, I mean, you see like Shelby and Nathan's, for example, has like 89,000 views. Um, 
you have another one like Maddie and Casey that has like 170. So like you've had like some really awesome response on your films, like with YouTube. Um, do you think there's like a, like a secret sauce to that for anyone who maybe like is wanting to upload their films to YouTube to get a little bit more exposure or to like build an audience and um, use it as a referral like kind of network? Yeah, I definitely think YouTube is becoming, you know, such a better search engine for videographers and looking mm -hmm. for great talent, um, you know, if couples are looking. Um, for me, I feel like I got in, I, I was very fortunate. I feel like a little bit of luck did play into it. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I posted one of the first um, cinematic wedding film shot on the A7S III, um, which Maddie and Cases, I feel like took off a little bit from that. And then it just kind of shot it up to just the wedding filmmaking like front page on YouTube. So it's it's a little bit of, I feel like mostly luck on that end. And then I think Shelby Nathan's kind of took off from that as well. Um, so, you know, I joke around. Um, I'm like, oh, just put cinematic in your title and <laughs> maybe it will take off. But, uh, but no, I feel like just timing has something to play into it. But definitely there is a certain part of just trying to stand out um, and just to make your craft your own. And we all kind of, you know, struggle to even find our, um, yeah, just our creative style. And, you know, but I encourage people, you know, if you feel like you found it and you're not getting traction on YouTube, it's okay. Because um, mm -hmm. it, does, it does require some luck and just good timing and good fortune. And I've just uh, been able to have that with uh, those two videos in particular. Yeah, that's really good advice. I think YouTube, I mean, even for me, when I started YouTube, like I feel like it's been six, seven years now. But when I like first uploaded my wedding films on YouTube and you see what others have found success at and maybe it's like a certain title that you see all oh, this wedding film will make you cry like 100%. Uh, you see those titles a lot and then... Yeah, like for instance, like you mentioned, like cinematic wedding film shot on the A7S III. Obviously, like any kind of camera uh, in your title is going to be uh, searchable and um, relevant. I think too, you you touched on that kind of with, you know, yes, it is luck, but it's also too, yeah, like you said, timing with like A7S III or cinematic or cameras that have just been released or people who are just mm -hmm. like, like who are interested in wedding filmmaking or filmmaking and want to see footage from these cameras, uh, your wedding films are a great um, resource for people who may be interested in that camera and want to see its capabilities. Um, there's also a, um, a dangerous side to that because I know it can get, you can get really lost in watching like an FX3 video and thinking, oh my gosh, yes, I need this camera in order to be like this good. And, and so mm -hmm. you, then you buy the camera and then you shoot with it and you're like, wait, why isn't my stuff not looking as good as, as this person's like, where am, where am I going wrong here? So there is a dangerous side to that, but like in moderation, I think, yes, YouTube is so beneficial and helpful for new filmmakers and um, especially couples. I mean, have you seen any kind of um, leads come through YouTube? Yeah. Most of my destination weddings I've had have come through YouTube. Um, just kind of outside of the state I'm in, um, I was able to shoot um, a elopement, my first elopement in Colorado, in Euro, wow. Colorado, through YouTube. They actually, Matt Johnson reviewed one of my films live and a couple, another oh, wow. videographer, a couple saw it and they reached out to me. Um, the wedding you helped me out with, they saw Maddie and Case's um, video on YouTube and reached out to me through that. And then there are some, I know I have next year, uh, another elopement in Colorado, Pennsylvania, and then in um, Park City, Utah, that all came from YouTube. Wow. So my destination weddings primarily are coming from YouTube. And I feel like that's where, um, you know, people want to get into destination films. Post your stuff on YouTube, even if you feel like it's not going to get a lot of traction initially. You know, I know Instagram... Also, people can post to and all that stuff. But I feel like that's where most of my destination weddings have come from is YouTube. Yeah, that's incredible. I think YouTube is just such a valuable resource for wedding filmmakers um, to, like you said, I mean, 
to book if you're looking to book destination weddings or you know there's there's couples all over the world on youtube i mean everyone is is searching you know well not everyone but couples who are you know in that wedding realm i should say are on youtube they're on like all of these different platforms and you know google is the largest search engine but google owns youtube and so that makes youtube the second largest search engine in the world exactly and yeah if if you can capitalize on that as a wedding filmmaker then yeah i mean case in point you're you're seeing a lot of success in the destination market for that um which is just really awesome i love that i love that youtube is becoming more of a um a magnet for you know new couples and and filmmakers to you know to find weddings that um really you speak to their brand and their style and um, the ones that, you know, they really want to do. So um, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, transitioning, I think that I kind of want to talk about something that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, and maybe you have as well. I don't know. Maybe you can um, add to this, but you know, I was looking at just long-term goals and I was thinking of like the future and I think everyone comes to a point in their careers, uh, whether that's a creative career or just careers in general, where it's like, where is the end game? You know, for me, I always wonder, you know, are weddings is being in the wedding filmmaking industry. Is it a short term venture or is it a long term venture? And, you know, I don't, I don't really have like the answer to that. Like I, would love to hear your thoughts on this because I kind of struggle with like, am I going to be like a 50, 60, 70 year old wedding filmmaker who's just, you know, still, still trucking along? Yeah. It's, it's one of those things. I'll just kind of echo you where, you know, even I don't have the answer <laughs> and it's, I guess it's just up to the person you're asking the question to. I know for me, I go back and forth um, just kind of looking into my future and one thing videography, wedding videography does, it's a lot on the body. So there's that physical aspect too. Um, you know, trying to do this, you know, I've seen, you know, people like uh, Nick Miller, John Bond, they're, I think, entering their 40s, close to that. And, you know, they're still going. Yeah. But, you know, for me, it's like, man, you know, I, I'm taking better care of my body. You know, I've been working out consistently. But man, those 12 hour days still can hit you like a rock. So there's that aspect where maybe I'll just answer personally. I don't feel like I'll be doing this my entire life, um, especially probably into my 40s. You know, I can feel like maybe I can keep it going through my mid 30s, late 30s. But beyond yeah. that, I feel like there's something more that I want to do. And I guess another side to that question is if I ever feel super um, uninspired or bored or the passion isn't there, I'll take a step back too. And, you know, financially as well, if there's, you know, you, for you, you just had, um, you just had a, a kid come into your life and that's a big responsibility. So I even look forward into that part of my life. And I'm like, man, do I want to be spending my weekends shooting weddings, you know, missing time with my my kids and my family? So I think that's the biggest thing for me. If it takes me away from my family a lot, um, that's not good. And at that point, I'll cut it out. Even just with my wife and I right now at this stage of our of our lives, you know, having I've been on this break from shooting weddings for it'll be three months by the time it's over. But man, having my weekends is nice. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's it's super enjoyable just to relax and to spend time with uh, my best friend, my wife, and you know, just have those times because time's something we don't get back. So that's just kind of my standpoint on it. Um, that's kind of where I've also been blessed, just with this job at the creative um, team at this church right now, to where hey, it's Monday through Thursday, Friday through Saturday, I'm off. And if I don't have a wedding, that's a three day weekend. And that's, you know, I know a lot of people don't have that, but, you know, for those who have families and everything and are also asking the same question, 
if one, you get feel just uninspired, take a break. You don't have to quit. But if it's really coming in between you and your family, just kind of take a step back and reevaluate things and, uh, you know, make sure your you know, any job shouldn't take precedent over your family. Mm, yeah, that's so good. That's so good. Yeah. And that's really where I've been at the last, I feel like even couple years, even before uh, we had Ashton, I, you know, weddings have always been a love hate for me. Um, and I don't know if anyone listening can relate to that, but I mean, it really has been just a love hate. And honestly, when COVID hit, I, I hate saying this, but I was honestly kind of thankful for the break because I mean, ever since I started the business in 2016, I mean, it had been go, go, go. I mean, every other weekend I was, I was filming a wedding and I was doing like the same venues and I was just going through the motions and everything just felt very monotonous and repetitive. And I just got to a point where I was feeling so disconnected from just the, the real meaning behind marriage and what a wedding should, should really um, be about. I was just getting this warped uh, message on just the sanctity of marriage. And I didn't, I was becoming jaded and I didn't like that. I didn't like that. My mind was taking me in just a, a negative direction when it came to the wedding um, industry. And like you said, I think the biggest thing, if you're feeling any kind of, um, uh, resistance or just uncertainty or I mean, even depression and burnout with, with weddings. I mean, taking a step back and just doing something different for a while can give you perspective um, and bring you back to that passion. Because I was thinking about this the other day is like, you know, I, I look back at 2016, 2017, when I first got going in weddings and I was so fired up. I was so excited about every wedding that I, I went to. I was like, man, this is so cool. Like I get to do this for a living. I get to you know, film what film weddings. I get to tell stories. And, and then it came to a point where I was just like, I don't have that anymore. And it hit me like a ton of bricks, man. I was just like, so upset. I'm like, Oh, like I want, I so desperately craved that passion and that fire again. And yeah, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm kind of with you. I don't see it as a long-term venture for me. I, I see it as, you know, there is a finish line. Um, do I know when that finish line is? I don't. Um, and I don't think anyone really has like a set date, you know, they're not like, oh yeah, I'm going to stop filming weddings September 26th on, you know, 2030 or whatever it is. No one has that. Um, I think it just, you know, like you um, mentioned, it just comes to a point where, um, you know, responsibilities change, you know, where you are at in your life, you know, all of those things have to be considered. Um, and I think, yeah, the biggest thing is if it pulls you away from the people that matter most in your life, then I don't think it's, it's worth it. I don't think any job is worth, you know, pulling you away from those that matter most. Um mm -hmm. And it's so true. Like, I mean, the, when I don't have a wedding on a weekend, I just, I feel so excited and maybe that's telling, I don't know. <laughs> maybe that's like, <laughs> it's we're getting old. <laughs> yeah. We're getting old. Like our bodies are breaking down. Like every eight, 10 hour wedding is just like, we have to spend the next week recovering. You know, just a funny story. I mean, honestly, when I turned 30, like I literally like i mean when i was 29 and i filmed the wedding season i was fine but then when some something about 30 hit and i felt like i needed a wheelchair i felt like i needed just uh, so much ibuprofen ice packs everywhere just to like soak in an epsom salt bath for like i don't know a year just to recover i just my body was just like breaking down and like it's it was so just eye opening for me that I knew that, okay, I guess there is, there is a cutoff at some point, you know, there is, um, there is a, a day where I can't do this at full speed anymore. And the days of me shooting like 30, 40 weddings are done. Like I can't, can't do that anymore. My, my max is like 20 and even 20 is like borderline. So yeah, it, yeah it, 20, it, 20, 20's a lot. <laughs> 20's a I lot. Mean, yeah, I mean, I I joke around, but I've I've second shot photo 
um, for a couple weddings. And I'm like, now this I could do for much longer. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was like, I could only carry, you know, I only have to bring one backpack with a flash and some lenses. I'm like, cool. Maybe, uh, you know, for some people, maybe just to change the photo. And, you know, yeah. that's also something. And I think kind of another thing to just kind of like keep that passion going is just kind of find the weddings that you'd really like to do. Mm. And, you know, I know some people, they're not at a place where they can just decline weddings that they may not really want to do just financially. But for me, I know that elopement just gave me so much life. It was, you know, just me, the couple, the photographer, my wife was with us too, helping me out. And it was just so intimate out in nature. And I'm like, man, maybe I can just do elopements the rest of my life, you know, go somewhere cool and intimate where there's not a wedding planner just breathing down your neck for the timeline to get going. <laughs> yeah. I'm thankful for wedding planners. They keep us on track. But, you know, there's a lot of just external forces on a normal wedding day. Um, yeah. But even just simplifying it to elopements or some people may be destination weddings. And if it's more traditional weddings and that's what you like, like, go for it. Um, but that's just another tip. Like, find find in the wedding industry the kind of weddings you like to do. And, uh, you know, and roll with that. You know, if you feel like you're stuck in a rut, um, you know, make the moves to get out of it. And whether that's taking a break or just finding, um, yeah, just the kind of films and couples you want to work with, you know, go for it. Yeah, I think that's 100% so true, especially when you get to a point in your business where you feel like you've just exhausted the traditional eight, 10 hour wedding day um, production aspects and yeah, it's, it's, there's so many external forces. I mean, especially with, you know, planners and uh, photographers and DJs and the types of weddings that you do work when it's inside of that very produced, very like staged, um, almost just unreal experience. Um, not unreal in the sense like that was unreal, but it's unreal in the sense of like it inauthentic, I guess is the better word to say. Yeah. Um, because when you do those weddings over and over again, it just it. I think that's where uh, the jaded mentality kind of evolves and kind of starts to sit with you. And then if you do those over and over again, it just every wedding feels like a production, and it doesn't feel real. It just feels like everything is so forced and unnatural. And um, I actually that was a really good point you made too about the elopements because the elopements that I filmed, I have felt more inspired and creative at those weddings than any other wedding like that I've ever shot. And Mm -hmm. I think it is, it's so true because it's, you're eliminating the production really, because it it is so intimate. It's so just raw. I mean, you're in like an exotic location, for example, the mountains or the forest or um, the beaches, whatever it is. And it's, it's just so serene and more peaceful and less chaos than the traditional weddings. Um, I almost now, like every single wedding I shoot that is the traditional, I always am so anxious going into the day. Mm -hmm. Even though I've done this like a million times, um, I always get so anxious because I'm overthinking what could go wrong. I'm overthinking like, is the planner going to be on her game today? Is the photographer going to be awesome to work with? Are they going to be just distant or... um, you know, not fostering that collaborative spirit. And am I going to get out of my head today? Am I going to be able to serve the couple well? And all of that gets eliminated when it's, it's just you, the photographer and the couple and the story. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, it, it is, it's so, I think that just tells you though, the types of weddings that are inspiring to you and that um, really make you feel uh, the most creative. Um and I know that like, yeah, for me, that's elopements. That's weddings where the couple fully, they understand uh, the essence of video and everything you're trying to do and um, versus couples that just want you to kind of go with the flow and, um, you know, capture the motions, so to speak. Just the very cookie cutter weddings, I should say. Mm. Absolutely. Um, yeah, those are just so uninspiring um 
But I will say, I mean, like you mentioned too, I mean, if you're not in a position, I think everyone has to go through that that season of weddings. You all have to start with those weddings that I've mentioned this before that like really no one wants to do. Uh, like you think you want to do them, but then you get to it and you're like, I don't want to do this. This is not the good me. old barn wedding. <laughs> exactly. The, the yeah. barn weddings, the pl- the weddings that have no planner, the ones that are just unorganized um, and the ones that are sadly, you know, budget conscious that are also more uh, frustrating, I guess I would say in the editing room, because you're kind of feeling like you have that creative uh, director overneath your shoulder, which is the the mom of the bride right here. That's telling you, oh yeah, uh, oh, yeah you got to add this and that. And I want some Fleetwood Mac in there, throw some, uh, some copyrighted <laughs> songs and uh, you know, really make this thing shine. And yeah. can we get Ed Sheeran? No, no, you can't. Yeah, yeah let's get some T Swifty in there. Like they really like, can we just go ahead and throw that in? Um, but, but yeah, I mean, there is, there is a journey to mm-hmm. getting to the place that you want to be in the wedding industry. And I feel like I'm, I'm almost arrived to that destination, right? I, I, I'm still doing some weddings that are more traditional uh, by nature and that are still the weddings that are, um, you know, not exactly where I'm, you know, my end game is, but um, for the most part, I would say about maybe 80% of the weddings I do, I really do enjoy. Um, yeah. Just because the couple are, they're really awesome. You know, the, the creative team is just super professional. Like I, I hardly do weddings anymore that are, um, you know, where there's a lot of problems or anything just like frustrates me. Um but yeah, I mean, for yeah, for anyone listening, hopefully that's encouraging that, you know, there is um there is a there is an exit to that place you want to be um in filming those weddings that you want to you want to film and that, that keep you inspired. Um but yeah, it's a constant constant battle of, you know, just the ebbs and flows of being a creative, I think is um what I'm learning. Yeah, yeah. and it's, you know, people who have been in this industry 10 plus years, you know, they go through the same thing, even, you know, in recent months. So it's, yeah, like you said, it's just that creative process, you know, we're always looking to get inspired. And, you know, if you feel like you're getting bored, change things up, you know, don't, don't feel like you have to stick to uh, one style or one way of um, doing your craft, you know, change things up. And I feel like even in my journey, um, you know, not sticking to one particular style, always changing it up, being fresh, feeding off the couple's energy, like all these things can kind of help you get out of a rut, feel inspired. And yeah, I think the big thing is kind of what you mentioned is a couple that has complete trust in you. Mm. That's the biggest compliment is just hearing, hey, I trust you, do your thing. Like, that's why we hired you. Yeah. And, you know, just bringing on that collaboration. I think all those things are important just to to stay creative. Absolutely. I'm yeah. like looking at my framing right now. I'm like, I guess I'm going for the Wes Anderson headspace over here. <laughs> like, your your head's getting cut in half by that door. <laughs> I know. I don't know what's going on. Oh man. Well, no, this has just been such a, such an awesome conversation uh, just about where I've just, a lot of thoughts have just been coming into my mind lately about where I see myself in five years, even 10 years with the wedding industry. And um, whether or not it's short term or long term, and yeah, I love I love the answers that you've you've provided, and I think it's different for everybody. It's going to be different for mm-hmm. everybody. It's you know, I, there's going to be, if not already, you know, some seventy year old wedding filmmakers who are still killing it. Um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna see that, and yeah. I've met a couple. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> I've uh, I've conversed with some on on YouTube where they they talk about where they started with, um, you know the the VHS style cameras and like you know now they're transitioning into like the digital world and um, yeah I think it's it's different for everyone I think everyone's creative journey is different um, it, it I think it all just depends on you know your your personality and I I feel like if you're a creative person. Um, it's, it's easy for us to get bored, um, because we're always looking for 
you know, something to satisfy that creative need and that desire. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes wedding filmmaking doesn't always provide that, especially if you're doing the same thing day in, day out. But, um, but I hope, yeah, I hope you guys listening have like found a lot of value out of this conversation. And if you're in that spot right now, I would love to just hear from you. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, this question. Do you think wedding filmmaking is, you know, short term or long term? What are your thoughts? Um, and yeah, if you're listening, be sure to check out Isaac's work on YouTube. Um, you can find him on uh, YouTube at Isaac Subtle Films. Uh, and where else can they find you? Uh, Instagram, where I rarely post, but <laughs> <laughs> same. I, same. I, I, Isaac Settle films there, and um, I'm not on TikTok, so uh, don't try to find me on there. <laughs> yeah, don't go looking for but, uh, his his dancing videos on TikTok. You will not yeah, find them. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, no, no dancing videos, especially you know. Hopefully, the ones that I've done when I was a teenager don't exist on there because uh, those oh, no. are embarrassing. But uh, that would be blackmail if my sisters uploaded those. But um, <laughs> and uh, no, I would uh, I would also love to hear the comments and what people say and where kind of they're at in their journey. And uh, and if you aren't following Jared, uh, follow him because he does a lot of educational stuff and he's killing it right now. So uh, subscribe to him if you haven't. You guys heard it. You got to subscribe if you want to uh, <laughs> hear more awesome conversations like this. So Isaac, man, thank you so much for hopping on. I appreciate your time and um, just sharing your heart and your journey. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoy the the next venture with, you know, your new gig and um, yeah, hopefully weddings kind of get better for you if you're, if you're wanting them to. Oh so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. It's definitely at a point where like, you know, I have having the break kind of like you said, it's just, it's kind of been a good reset and just, I'm looking forward to getting back into the season, but, uh, but no dude, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's been fun. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for listening. And until next time, we'll see you. See ya.